Okay, uh, so uh, welcome everybody who made it here to this room. Also welcome everybody in the live stream. Uh, we are here to talk about communication between uh, Linux host systems and FPGA-based subsystems. My name is Alex. Uh, I'm based in Munich, Germany. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I've been tackling problems with software for 20 plus uh, years and in the last at least 10 years I've been drifting more and more to uh, embedded uh, software and uh, especially systems which rely on Linux and uh, FPGA part. These days I'm wearing two hats. Uh, I work as an R&D engineer at Maneric. We make uh, laser-based communication for aerospace, free space communication, pretty cool technology. Uh, but what I've been doing uh, for a while longer is MPSI Technologies. Um, it's a startup with the goal to uh, provide the embedded community with developer tools that replace repetitive and boring coding tasks by model-based source code generation. The tools are out there. In terms of adoption, there is still work to be done. Now, on this slide, uh, I will show you a couple of uh, scenarios, uh, which uh, most of them I have come across, um, where you have communication between uh, Linux host and the FPGA-based subsystem. The legend is common for all, so uh, typically the purpose uh, can either be you want to invoke a command from the host on the FPGA and get a reply, or you want to sh uh, shovel data between the two systems, buffer transfers. Um, in terms of bandwidth, um, uh, you have um, different, uh, there are different levels to it. Uh, depending on the application, you will need uh, more or less bandwidth. I will, you, you will immediately see this in the different scenarios which I will be showing. So, uh, a very simple reason, uh, but a very justified reason to talk between a host system and an FPGA-based subsystem is you want to debug what is happening in the FPGA-based subsystem in a bit more uh, comfortable way than with JTAG, counting zeros and ones. Uh, but this is an application which doesn't require a lot of bandwidth, so you would probably pick a UART over USB connection. Um, FPGAs are very good at reducing data, so you can have a source like an ADC that uh, produces uh, lots of data, uh, and instead of bothering the Linux system with it, uh, you can put the uh, high-performance algorithm or the uh, uh, the data crunching algorithm in the FPGA and just uh, transport the result uh, to the host system. Uh, then, of course, there are also systems uh, where you want a high amount of data to be transferred uh, to the Linux host, or you need to have that. Um, and then uh, you, would, uh, you would need a high bandwidth interface here, PCIe, and uh, it's intentional that already the connected uh, SRAM is shown on this uh, graph because typically you would go over the memory um, to talk to the host system, probably using DMA. A quite uh, common variant of Linux host system and FPGA uh, subsystem uh, since around 10 years is um, FPGA SOC devices which combine uh, compute cores which run Linux and, and FPGA fabric in one device. Uh, that simplifies things because then the interconnect is already given. Uh, it's a typically, a, oh, no, actually in all devices I know of is an AXI interconnect. Um, but again, the, um, uh, the principle remains the same. Uh, something which uh, uh, which is quite tempting with such devices is also uh, that you look at the FPGA and see, oh, it has so many free IOs, let's uh, route uh, some low-level interfaces through these pins. There is nothing wrong with that. And that's where I show these additional lines where you make, um, make, uh, uh, make connections available as drivers, um, but they are routed through the FPGA fabric. Finally, um, something quite popular recently is the uh, so-called, well, the accelerator uh, scenario, uh, where the FPGA isn't even connected to uh, external data source like an ADC or 
Ethernet, something which physically provides data, but where the FPGA is only used for acceleration. Uh, I will not talk about this here um, for two reasons. First of all, I know nothing about it. Uh, but second, also, um, you are then talking about uh, high-level synthesis or uh, also um, the tightly integrated um, a neural network framework where the vendors will provide you with something where you don't even need to think about that you have an FPGA there. Now the reason why uh, we've been looking a lot at uh, the interface between um, uh, Linux host and FPGA based subsystem is uh, in the context of our uh, developer tools for model based code generation. Uh, we have a demo project, which is this uh, tabletop 3D laser scanner. You have a turntable and then a five megapixel camera and two line lasers controlled by some kind of embedded system. And we have uh, lots of variants for that system. Um, and um, so I list uh, the ones which uh, correspond to our scenario here. Uh, we have one where uh, we have a lattice device uh, connected UART over USB to a laptop, uh, where obviously only control and result can be transferred through such low bandwidth. But then we also have a device where um, we, uh, we choose a different architecture and then um, we pass high bandwidth uh, camera data directly to the Linux and then we need PCIe. Um, another one is... Uh, quite recent SOC, microchip polar fire SOC, uh, and uh, then the usual contenders as well, uh, Xilinx Zinc, uh, and also some other devices, which however don't fit in the pattern of this presentation. I'm showing a bit of uh, software functionality for this project because I will be using this project throughout the presentation. So um, preview uh, image acquisition, um, we are just doing binning. That's a very good algorithm to be run on an FPGA and not uh, on a Linux system. Um, we have another one. This is a bit hard to see, I guess. Um, it's identifying the corners of a checkerboard. Um, they're uh, shown in blue, a bit hard to see, sorry. Uh, and then for the uh, 3D laser scanner operation, finally, we have identification of um, line lasers in the image. Um, so we make differential images between laser on and laser off. Uh, each of these algorithms can either be performed on the Linux host or on the FPGA. So we have uh, something to play with here. And of course, as you can imagine, this will greatly vary the load uh, on the interconnect. Uh, the less data is processed uh, on the CPU, the less uh, bandwidth you need. So um, with that as an introduction, um, I would uh, like to give you the outline uh, of uh, the things I want to be talking about. Uh, similar to the network layers uh, in this uh, scenario, you, ha you can say uh, you have on the bottom a physical layer, uh, then a hardware abstraction layer, where it then does not become important anymore what is the physical interface. Uh, protocol layer and uh, application layer. Um, so I'm starting with the physical layer. These are some typical uh, bandwidth uh, results you can achieve without doing any tweaking. Or, of course, you can get some high performance uh, chips here and there, which will probably get the numbers up. But without putting in a lot of effort, this is typical bandwidth you can achieve in the communication between the two sides. Uh, so on the lower end, you, uh, you, you get uh, UART already from um, uh, most embedded, SO I mean, actually all SOCs I have seen will have some sort of UART connectivity. UART over USB is uh, particularly interesting for debugging, so you don't have to worry about the long cable lengths. Uh, USB will handle that, and then only the last piece which goes into your FPGA is uh, UART. Um, SPI, similarly, uh, and then the last three ones are rather higher speed uh, interconnects. So if you use uh, AXI Lite, which is the uh, interconnect you have in all FPGA SOCs, um, 
you get to uh, 50 megabytes per second, which is already quite something uh, with 32-bit words and 100 megahertz clocks. Uh, AXI Lite uh, always has a lot of um, handshake around each word which is uh, transferred. So it's not really optimized on that side, but it's imp easy to uh, deal with. Um, PCIe is a typical solution if you have uh, two different, uh, maybe even PCBs talking to each other. Um, uh, you need uh, differential pair routing um, and some control, but you can get to 250 megabytes per second per lane uh, in the PCIe 1 configuration. And finally, if you use the full um, uh, power of uh, the AXI interconnect, um, uh, here in an example, 64-bit time uh, in the burst configuration, then you can go to 700 megabit per second or higher. Uh, next up, hardware abstraction. So from here, I'm separating between the uh, host side and the FPGA side. So to me, hardware abstraction on the host side, which is Linux, uh, is, um, well, what kind of driver do you have? And the good news is that really uh, you can get very far with simple character device drivers. The transfers are controlled by the host, the Linux host. And in the end, you have uh, open, read, write, close. That's really handy. And this is then possible for <clears throat> uh, all these three types of interfaces. And I just listed some typical uh, device files you would find on your system if you have it. Uh, board with a good board support package, they should already be there. Um, and uh, then the AXI Lite category um, is also easily implementable like that. You can write a very simple driver. Um, I guess it's a bit hard to read, but uh, if you get an address space of only four ad uh, consecutive addresses, you can make a very simple handshake um, where you notify the FPGA site, okay, a read transfer is starting, write transfer is starting, then you send the actual data, you implement a timeout, and in the end you can provide this as a, um, as a character device driver. It's very simple. I'm mentioning this because the vendors will typically also provide you something, uh, uh, and before you know it, uh, you would be vendor locked, and. Uh, Here's maybe the moment to avoid that and just write a very simple driver that can be cross-vendor. Um, I have very good experience with that. Um, then there is the advanced category in which I count uh, yeah, the high bandwidth interfaces, PCIe and uh, AXI4 in the full bandwidth uh, configuration, which if you think about it, typically will only make sense if you use DMA and interrupts. Um, because, uh, well, Linux has a scheduler. <laughs> it decides when it has times. And if you want to transfer huge chunks of data, it's better to uh, write them into the memory and then have the Linux part after an interrupt um, working on that data. So um, the UIO uh, already has features for that integrated with PCIe. Um, and uh, there is also a helpful article, it helped me to write a, a driver using this PCIe. Uh, and what I also saw is tomorrow there will be a talk about debugging PCI Express. Uh, so that's certainly interesting. Uh, in my case, I experimented uh, with this, uh, with a, uh, ARM, uh, yeah, IMX6 host and, uh, um, and the Lattice as a client. Uh, and fortunately there I didn't, uh, well, there was not so much to, to debug. <laughs> um, now switching over to the FPGA side, uh, again, uh, for, the, um, for the simple protocols, UART SPI and on the next slide also AXI Lite, uh, it's very simply implemented. There is no need to use any uh, vendor core for this. Uh, you can easily write uh, or Download, uh, I will give you the sources, uh, the references in the end. A very simple VHDL modules that handle um, UART RX, UART TX, uh, and SPI slave. Uh, 
and eggs are light, so you just have to, do, to react to some, um, some of the uh, handshake signals of the eggs are light uh, bus, and that is really not difficult. Um, now for the more, um, for the PCIe. Um, PCIe uh, is uh, on the FPGA side a bit more advanced because it typically directly uh, connects to the vendor specific uh, uh, gigabit transceivers. So it cannot really be uh, fully cross vendor. Um, the good news is uh, from the free vendors, uh, these blocks which provide the PCIe handshake are free of charge, uh, although not all of this uh, is necessarily open source. So this is what I found a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, so, you can, um, so you can at least work with this, yeah. Um, now I want to show you um, the higher layers, not one by one, but by the example of uh, first uh, uh, showing how a transfer from host to FPGA could look like, or an interaction that's triggered by the host, and then, uh, and then the way back <laughs> afterwards. Um, so, uh, starting here uh, on the application layer then, um, here I'm using the example of a terminal, uh, which you can use to invoke commands um, uh, from, uh, yeah, you, you type in a command basically on your host side, uh, and then we will uh, go all the way until it uh, is received and acknowledged on the FPGA. Um, here, this is a functionality uh, where I can, uh, in a small web user interface, click my commands together, and I pick the command uh, stepper motor move to. So if you remember this reference application with the tabletop laser scanner, uh, it has a turntable that's driven by a stepper motor. Um, so uh, a natural command for the module that controls the stepper motor in the FPGA is move to. So um, it's visible there at command sequence, uh, also a bit slow, so uh, small. Uh, it has two arguments. Uh, you give an angle and T-step would basically be how fast should the motor turn. Um, so from there, um, uh, yeah, what has to happen next? So you want to invoke this command, um, and in the um, uh, scenario I'm showing here, there is a automatically generated library on the um, uh, on the on the host side, uh, which which translates this um, uh, command into a bytecode that is then to be passed uh, to, the, to the FPGA. Uh, it is listed a bit here, so there is, um, uh, this is like the first section of the zoom in. Um, there are two uh, T axes where you first say okay, uh, where you tell the uh, FPGA first, okay, I'm invoking a command. Uh, this is the target. Uh, and I'm sending also five bytes of uh, parameter data. This is then the second um, uh, transmission, and then you receive back and acknowledge if everything went well. Second command is step get info, so that's the second block over there. Um, you would uh, pull the uh, angle, which the FPGA knows, because it's counting the steps it puts into the stepper motor, uh, until um, it ha you have reached the target, and that's basically it. Um, so we have seen uh, the host side, the Linux side, and now what happens on the FPGA side? Well, you might know in FPGA is typically everything uh, is hierarchical, uh, but uh, that must not necessarily be the uh, logical representation of the system. Um, so in this case, you would start from the left-hand side. Uh, there is somewhere the uh, AXI PSPL switch. Um, then you have your little um, uh, uh, FPG, uh, VHDL module that uh, decodes the um, AXI, trans, AXI light transfer um, uh, that's passed through an RXTX block and in the module host interface, uh, the decoding of the 
uh, byte string uh, takes place, and it will then know to give a handshake uh, or a request uh, to the stepper motor VHDL module. So this is uh, the endpoint, so to say, of our command invocation. Uh, there is a request acknowledge uh, signal, and uh, then below the parameters are passed. Um, yeah, so that would be a very simple example of um, command transfers between uh, host, Linux host, and FPGA. And uh, for the way back, uh, I have chosen uh, instead something which requires higher bandwidth, uh, and that is um, preview image. Um, uh, transmission. So uh, the camera, so it's again left to right, uh, the camera supplies, uh, yeah, uh, five megapixel images, uh, which in the end implies a bandwidth of 150 megabyte per second, but then you shrink them and, um, uh, and you can transfer them to the host uh, with a uh, regular AXI light um, uh, interface. Uh, so there's uh, some modules involved again, so starting from CAM acquisition, ACQ, the third from the left, uh, where the actual binning takes place. Uh, there is a AB buffer situation or ping pong buffer uh, where uh, always one buffer is being written to while the other is being uh, read out to the host. It goes again through the uh, host interface that handles the handshake with uh, the Linux host and then it's basically um, vice, uh, the, the, the return of what we had seen on the previous slide. Um, this is definitely too small to read, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so what the host does, um, it basically uh, pulls the buffer status, uh, that's again a command invocation if you will, uh, and then if it changes to A, a buffer full or B buffer full, it will initiate um, the buffer transfer. And then, okay, then it goes all the way to a web-based user interface, but that is definitely beyond the application layer, which I mean um, by the little table that's shown there on the right upper corner. Um, I'm, I can't deny that uh, I'm a big fan of uh, model-based source code generation. Um, so for these examples, um, I have used uh, our open source tool to uh, generate from one single source of truth, uh, one model file, uh, all the glue code, if you want, between that was required from the place where we invoke um, the method in C++ to where it arrives uh, and is being handled um, on the FPGA site in VHDL code. Um, and also for the way back, uh, this uh, model-based approach is quite useful. Um, so uh, how, how it's done, uh, just very quickly. So um, we have uh, model input files for the modular structure of the FPGA site. Um, so here it's shown in Xilinx uh, Vivado how it then looks like, this hierarchical structure. Uh, and for some of those modules, we say these modules are special modules named, which we name controller. Uh, and you can attribute a command set to each of these com controllers, like the one we had seen, uh, step, which had the command move to and get info. Uh, so once we tell this to the tool, um, in a second model file, we say, well, what are the commands and what are the invocation and return parameters? Uh, and based on that uh, description, uh, it is possible uh, uh, to, to generate uh, the code, uh, all the code on the C++ side and on the VHDL side to make such transfers work, uh, commands and buffer transfers. Um, here I would also show, like to show um, uh, three different uh, concepts um, of how you, uh, how on the application layer, like above the hardware abstraction layer, um, you can possibly uh, interact between uh, Linux host and uh, FPGA-based subsystem. Uh, so the one in the first column uh, we had seen, 
uh, in the stepper motor example and also the buffer example. Uh, I call it simple. <laughs> Uh, you are on the Linux side and you have uh, blocking access to uh, the FPGA resource for all uh, requests for buffer uh, transfers or commands. Uh, and uh, in the FPGA you had seen there is one host interface module, um, so it handles requests one at a time. Uh, an advantage of that is it requires a quite low FPGA footprint, uh, but um, I also indicated that you may have to pull the status, like in our case, how far has the stepper motor already been turning. You have to pull that all the time. That's maybe not ideal, uh, especially in view that uh, FPGAs uh, are uh, meant, I mean, they are ideal candidates for parallel processing, so something like that is not really great. Uh, second option um, uh, is uh, callback-based. So uh, here the idea is you launch a command, for example, the move to command uh, for the stepper motor, uh, and then you get uh, replies to that from the FPGA side until the target is reached. Um, this can be solved uh, by having a command invocation and return uh, buffers uh, on the FPGA side. So, um, that uh, requires a larger FPGA footprint, but it is also much more uh, powerful uh, if you have many things going on at the same time. Uh, something which you might have missed here is uh, something which is typically done. Maybe some of you have worked with um, uh, these uh, cameras where uh, for configuring them you have to write uh, hundreds of register uh, with a specific value. Uh, in a specific order. Uh, so that's something which um, I think if you have an FPGA and you have Linux on the other side, I would uh, not recommend, although it's industry standard and good for bare metal, but the problem is um, it is not really well defined uh, what happens uh, if you mistakenly write two registers in the wrong order. Um, yes. Uh, that uh, brings me to my first conclusion. Okay, <laughs> Linux host to FPGA connectivity is not rocket science. Um, uh, why is that so, in my opinion? So what helps? Um, you have on the hardware side uh, not so many different um, standards that are being used, uh, although from, uh, there are several vendors out there which you could consider. Um, uh, and uh, these hardware interfaces, uh, they are both supported by the Linux kernel since very long uh, and also um, uh, on the FPGA side, they are either very easy to implement uh, or the IP as for PCIe is uh, free of charge and in some cases, not all, uh, also open source. Um, so uh, for this specific aspect uh, also, I think that the uh, model-based generation of source code for this uh, inter uh, interaction uh, is uh, helpful. Uh, it simplifies life uh, because in the end, uh, it even allows you to have an interface agnostic uh, communication uh, and you're also avoiding vendor lock-in. So before uh, I conclude uh, finally, <laughs> I would like to stress uh, all of the code uh, which we have come up with uh, throughout um, yeah, our experiments uh, is open source. Uh, you will find it on the Git repositories. If you're looking for a specific uh, interconnect uh, and you cannot immediately find it, find it feel free, free to uh, drop me a line. Uh, and. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention and am open for questions. Questions? If not, then that's it. Then that's I, joined, it. I think the next sessions begin, one second. Um, 
at, uh, yeah, 545 or the next sessions. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.